What's up, you fucking turtle dicks? This is Willie McMillan. I'm here with Andrew Hardingham, uh, one of the wildest Canadians I've ever met in my entire life. And okay. uh, we've we've got an, uh, a great guest today. He's a uh, he's an outstanding friend. He's uh, a part time rancher. He's a snake mil milker. A snake milker? Yeah, he's a snake milker. He uh. <laughs> It's hard to get. He's got, you know, he, he got work ethic beat into him at a young age. Um, I believe he learned how to snowboard on cow shit. I mean, you can imagine, <laughs> the, you can perfect. imagine the face shots that went down that day. Um, what else? He's a, he's a fucking outlaw. He's a convicted felon. And he's also the only person that I can truthfully say has had lunch at elton john's house ladies and <laughs> ladies and gentlemen the one and only mark carter <laughs> intro i just well, came out intro like that one day well maybe maybe play it so that carter can just listen to the jingle <laughs> I'm actually pretty fucking tan right now. You just like a tell. German tourist that wears black socks and flip flops <laughs> on the beach, but just put sunscreen on their face. That's what you've been doing all week. Yeah. <laughs> no, I've been, I've been fucking going to the nude beach. That's where it's at. Carter's been there. Oh, yeah. I, just, <laughs> I watched. I won't even say. Did you guys it, go no. together? <laughs> well, yeah, we, we had, did. We had ladies with us though. Sure. I watched a man touch another man's nose with his. His butthole at the beach. Really? Yeah. Was it intentional? Yeah. Yeah. I think they were dating or they were together. Oh, good. That's nice then. That's you love. Bobsy twins? Really? No. I don't Dude, remember that. How can you not forget that? That is like being like burned into my memory. The the Bobsy twins that were like next to us and they were just having they were having a great time. But that one just backed up on that dude's face. I don't remember no. that. Was there any we no tongue-in or anything? There was no gay gay stuff after that? Well, I think the dude was trying to apply sunscreen and wasn't paying attention. Oh, and then that's the other funny. dude's butthole was just that's like just on his funny. nose. Yeah. yeah, it was fun. It was great for everybody. Yeah. I did see a I did see a guy jacking off facing <laughs> us the other day. <laughs> he was like sitting Indian style jacking off. And like, I was like I told Karen, I was like, look to your right. And she like, she like glanced over and the dude was just like staring at us, jacking off. And then, I don't know, we just like gave him some really bad vibes. And then he finally like, and then he turned around and just jacked off towards the hill. It was so fucking... It was it's just, so weird. Like, like, there's way too many penis men at those nude beaches. You yeah. think it's going to be glorious and there's going to be a bunch of sexy women there. But it's mostly it depends. Just old fat fucking penis men. There's a lot. There's a lot of that, but it just depends on what section of the beach you're at. There's definitely like the grinder zone, and <laughs> and, and and then there's like you know where you go with your with your lady. <laughs> I thought you were going to mention that he also has a, a a buffalo skin rug that he uh, lays he beds women on, and I thought you were going to go even deeper. But now, as soon as you bring. Uh, Carter on, you can see he's sitting on a buffalo skin in the cabin. Is that oh, it's cold? It's cold up here in Jackson. It looks like uh, the blanket you're sitting on is made out of the same material as your beard, almost. <sighs> kinda, yeah. kinda. Yeah, I think it's actually goat. It's not. An <laughs> is that part like of the a, chair? Or is it's it a, a blanket? dirty goat? It's ibex. <laughs> you should oh, ride my roommate. Ra Crazy man, she gets this stuff over in Austria. You should wrap that thing around you and do the interview like that, dude. Like uh, <laughs> just in from the trap lines. Uh, I've just been out milking. It's cold. Yeah, what's up, Mark? How are you doing? I'm doing great. I, you know, it's so good to see your face, meet you, Andrew. See everybody, man. It's uh, it's been a minute. I don't know how long it's been. More than a minute. It's but, been a while. And it's the season, amazing. how's the season going? Uh, I'm up great. here in the Rockies, but you're down there in the Rockies, so I love hearing about it. It's been uh, a slow start. You know, we had a pretty pretty fast 
uh, November, it was good. It looked like it was going to be all-time winter. And then December came and we got no snow. Um, it's starting to snow a little bit, but we have just a really dangerous snowpack. So it's kind of been tiptoeing around, just slowly inching into the mountains, dealing with the layers and just like that kind of anxiety of, of uh, the sleeping dragon. So it's kind of certain decisions. Right on. Lots of, lots of resort riding right now until it's on. But it's like, you know, Mother Nature dictates all and you just have to be patient and um, kind of take what she gives you and don't force it. You think uh, you think we're gonna have a a good spring? Yeah, I mean, like, I'm always better. optimistic, man. Yeah, I mean, I'm just like poor, poor me. You know, I'm still snowboarding. I still have a job. Uh, the snow may not be the the best, but that's kind of like a bitch way to look at it. Yeah. Um, it is what it is. You know, I mean, it's so fortunate to just be be out. Sorry. Well, you know, even resort riding, it can be so amazing. And after I watched, uh, do you guys, have you guys watched much from Ken Deet, that French uh, skier? No. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. He's like the the craziest best resort skier I've ever seen in my life. He's the craziest best skier. Oh, yeah, Ken Deet. But, yeah. oh, my God, what he just turns his resort into is like, it, I almost don't want to go in the backcountry anymore. Yeah, it's I just insane. want to do that. The lines that he like he fucking pieces together through the resort and there's just like innocent bystanders sitting around uh, yeah. while he's just like fucking lying over him everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What's amazing about that is he makes skiing look fun. Yeah, oh. he does. He I'm makes thinking, it look good. Thinking about doing it now. <laughs> Cause again, he's bringing them back. He's bringing think, them uh, the people I who think, stole from the sport. I think Mark's on acid right now. What's going on here with the screens? There we go. Okay. Uh, okay. So yeah. Hey, uh, okay. Uh, let's 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 organize ourselves here. We're all okay. having fun. Go, <laughs> go it's ahead. like the morning Andrew. after you drink and you get a little giggly, you know, where everything's just funny for some reason. Yeah, that's how I feel right now. Okay. Okay. Super serious. Yep. Okay. Let's get serious about this shit. <laughs> Carter, so. ask the the hard questions. Wait, I want to know about you snowboarding on cow shit. Oh, shit. Yeah, I, feel like I mean. I feel like you told me that one time that you, like, went down this little hill and then you, like, yeah. ate shit into cow shit. And that was, like, your first run ever or something. Dude, yeah, you know, it's a very vivid memory of the first snowboard I was, I was given on Christmas. And it was, like, a, it was a black snow mogul monster, as you're probably oh, familiar yeah. with. Yep. No metal edges. I had one of those. Um, I had that same board. Little, <laughs> that board was dangerous. You know, you didn't really realize that you needed metal edges back then. But, you know, it was more of just a sled because we loved to sled. And my, my intro into, um, like, snowboarding and the, my love for snow and just sliding around on snow was, you know, when I was very young, my dad, he'd go, he'd pull us behind the truck in our sleds. And that was, just, like, the funnest thing we could possibly do. It was like, and I couldn't get enough of that. And so he'd like all, my brother and my sister and I'd all be behind the, the truck and he'd be pulling us and we'd hit sagebrush. You know, it wasn't like a lot of snow, but just enough to slide. Um, and then obviously we, I got a snowboard and that was kind of a game changer. And then there was this little hill up behind the, you know, the house and it was up in the crowd. And I don't know if you know anything about frozen cow shit, but like a cow will just drop a big load in the winter and then it freezes. So it's like a big hard lump yeah and we dropped into this little hill with no control and you hit these lumps in the crowd and it would just like launch you and that was before you understood that you actually needed to transition to land on and my knees were great and so it was like flat landings were fine and i'll never forget that because that was like the first air time i ever caught was like it was hitting, off of cow shit yeah hitting turd kickers okay and okay. then like that kind of evolved into you know my dad we'd have all the cows in the field and, you know, he'd go ride through the field every day and check the calves, like for sick calves or whatever, and doctor them. And he would pull us behind his horse. He'd dally off, give us a rope and, and pull us behind his horse um, in a sled. He could only do one at a time. But I remember like vividly riding behind dad and like hitting hard cow turds. And he was like pulling me with his horse. And I always thought that was kind of cool. Um, and that was like, you know, made me love 
shit and air at the same time. So, <laughs> so <laughs> did, did you ever build cheese cheese wedges out of cow shit? No, no, I never. Like did, you just I you mean, just hit them natural. You never like stack yeah. them up or anything. Yeah, they would just be like uh, uh like a just a just a turd, just a, like a you know like six ten inch tall, depending on how yeah. you know how much you like drop. Like a cow made mogul. Exactly, and you just hit it right in the center, and it, you could catch air. I can see yeah. genius. <laughs> at least yeah, genius. Was, at least it was frozen, though. You know. Oh yeah, like, it was frozen. I was I'm waste his cow. whole day building kickers. He had shit everywhere. He used oh man, cows earth. like the shit. <laughs> I've been yeah. dipped in shit my whole life. Like, like cow shit doesn't bother me one bit. Like I've had it, you know, it slapped in my mouth, slapped all over my face and my eyeballs. Uh, cow shit just doesn't bother me. Just grass, you know. It's like it's just cow shit. You do know? you have it's a like, good? Uh, do you have like a good, money? Do you have a good like shit your pants story? Have you ever shit your pants? Like shit my pants. I mean, who hasn't shit their pants? Yeah, but you got a I story. Don't have, I don't have like. I don't have like a good, like, shit my pants story that like it's like monumental in my life. I mean, you're just like you shit your pants, you're like fuck. Yeah. I mean, this day sucks, you know. I yeah, obviously you don't have to sit in it. Well, <laughs> you know, you know, when that that eclipse was going on. <laughs> so like we hiked up to this butte by like uh, Cash Creek or whatever. There's a big group of us. We had been partying the night before. I was so hungover and fucked up. And whatever, Sean O'Brien gives me a Pabst Blue Ribbon on the hike up. And those things just, like, destroy me. <clears throat> so, anyway, we're sitting up there, and the eclipse is about to happen. And I'm like, what the fuck? I got, like, three or four minutes till it's going to happen. And luckily, Sean had, like, a pocket pocket because he was, like, prepared for that kind of thing. Anyway, I ended up like running into these trees and like I watched the whole eclipse while I was spraying fucking baby <laughs> diarrhea like behind these trees. And there was like children like seven feet away from me on the other side of the, the bushes. There's like 50 people like seven to 10 feet away from me just with like a little bit of bushes separating us. And I'm just like, ah, just like shitting all over the forest as the eclipse is happening. So <laughs> lunar, lunar or solar? I don't know. Whatever, whatever that big deal. It was a solar. Was. Solar. Okay. Solar eclipse. But yeah, like oh. went fucking pitch dark for a second and like everyone was like kind of making noise, you know, like cheering or whatever. And that's when I decided was a good window to like really push <laughs> push it, you know. <laughs> anyway, dude, I just like I like was over and I walk out of the woods and the whole crew I was with is just fucking laughing at me. And I'm walking up, up all shameful, like, you know, just fucking so humiliated that yeah. I had to you shit hit, and you hit a people. low that day. Yeah, yeah, Willie. Yeah, but nobody us, even knew it. Tell us about this. Uh, this when you went and had lunch at Elton John's house, you like tried to bring your skateboard in the house or something. Oh my God, Elton John's house. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, um, I'm gonna have to yeah. explain how that became how that came about too. Yeah, like, it's not like you just get invited to Elton's house. Um, it was an interesting time of my life, you know. I, I was I was dating a nice a nice young lady, and she yeah she was awesome. Um, Rachel, um, we're still super good friends. Um, and she actually worked for her cousin who was Justin Timberlake, and we we just started dating. And she, you know I, I you know I'm from Tensleep, dude. I I've traveled a little bit. You know I've been overseas, and she kind of you know figured I could I could be thrown into the fire so she asked she invited me on this European adventure of sorts and they were going to go over there for uh, a few weeks and uh, he had some obligations in Paris and in London and it seemed like a, a pretty once in a lifetime opportunity to go cruise around Europe with those guys so obviously I I accepted and you know fast forward to our time in London well, he, Justin was like, a uh, Elton does this, um, this, this benefit for AIDS every year. It's called the Blue Tie and Tierra Ball. And he, he hosts it at, at his estate. 
And it's this amazing estate out in Windsor, outside of London, by the, like the Queen's Castle and all these like ancient properties, you know, like so much history. And so they set up a whole venue out there. But so Justin had to show up early that day to um, like do sound checks and, and prepare for the, the concert that night. So we just roll out there, you know, and I'm, I'm just trying to get some exercise because I'm kind of a freak when I sit around a lot. We've been traveling and I bought my skateboard and, and I just wanted to like move. And I, I didn't know what to really expect in Windsor. I was kind of hoping there was some cement. So we literally roll up, drop Justin off at the kind of like we roll into the property, drop, drop Justin off at the, the, the venue and then cruise over to Elton's house. And it's like gravel. So I'm already kind of disappointed. You know, I have like my skateboard and I like get out of the car and I'm waiting like we're with Elton's assistant and it's Rachel and she's like grabbing her things and. I like grab my skateboard and the assistant just like looks at me. He's like, dude, like, what do you, like, there's nothing to skater. Like, what do you do with your skateboard? It's like, ah, oh, maybe I'll just leave this in the trunk, I guess. All right. So then, then I like, I like just standing at the front door waiting for Rachel. You know, I'm, I'm kind of new to this, like whole, this whole scene, but I'm just am who I am. So I'm a pretty honest person and kind of speak what's on my mind. And dude, the door, the front door opens and here's Elton. I'm just like, right on, man. And he's wearing a straight up like white Adidas jumpsuit and like his iconic uh, like rose circular glasses. Russian like, gangster. Nice. Dude, just gangster. <laughs> and he's like, you know, I'm like uh, standing there. He's like, hi, I'm Elton. I was like, hi, hi I'm Mark. You know, shake hands. Like, yeah. Nice guy. And then uh, he was just so inviting. And we spent the day with him just like kind of kind of cruising around his property. He gave us a whole tour of his house, which is just unbelievable. Um, just the, like, from the photography collection he has to the art and, and all the in-between, it was cool to just, like, sit down with lunch with him and his husband and Justin and, and listen to these guys, like, talk about music. And Elton is very informed on every genre of music. Like, it was... Um, it was an eye-opening experience. He was like one of the one of the coolest people I've ever met, you know. And and I've always like had a lot of respect for his music, but I wasn't really like into his stuff. But um, after spending the day, and then you know the 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 event started that night, and I mean, who the who's who of anyone was there at this event? I mean, from Keith Richards to uh, Vladi Klitschnikov, like that crazy boxer. I mean, it was everybody was there. Um, you just, it's, it's, it's funny when you see like really famous people. Cause you're like, I know you, how do I know you? Like you, you're like, Oh fuck, you're Keith Richards. That's why I know you. I don't know you. Um, but to say, you had to, you had to, to stop say, saying like, where do we know each other from? Like, oh, do you, do I know you? You were at Jackson. Like, did I see in the tram line? <laughs> it was an not interesting, it. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was just really interesting, but like, I'd say like one of the coolest things was actually watching him perform. You know, I got to sit side stage and it was a, it was a really crazy night because it was the night they all found out. Like, so we're like backstage in the green room with Justin and his whole team, like Johnny Wright, like all these people that are like, so like Justin's band, like they're so entwined in the music industry. And that was the night that they found out Michael Jackson had died and everybody had a close connection to Michael. Mm -hmm. So like, everybody's kind of like taking a drink for Michael before they go out and perform, which was like this kind of crazy. I'm just like sitting in the corner, like, Whoa, this is like, what yeah. the fuck am I doing? It was here? Ritual. You know? but yeah, it was crazy. And, um, I was able to, to sit side stage, like, you know, 10 feet from Elton on his piano as he just fucking rocked the house. Like, and was you know, his music is amazing, but like to feel the energy, that someone of his caliber like lets off during a performance and the energy of the crowd. I mean, the true entertainers and Justin alike, like they yeah. are the top A grade musician entertainers for a reason. And it's yeah. like their music's amazing, but like how they perform was just, I mean, it was mind blowing to, to sit there and watch that, to watch that performance. And I mean, everybody was freaking out. So uh, that was like, that was a pretty cool, pretty cool, uh, time of my life you know yeah wow, sure. what an experience too and yeah. justin's an avid snowboarder too he loves the yeah. sport and he loves justin, getting out yeah justin loves to shred and we had we had some great days um 
riding too, you know, over the winters. And yeah, he's, he's actually, he's really good at snowboarding. I mean, he's a talented, talented fella. And one of the funniest, funniest people like sit down, like talking shit and listen to his stories at dinner are just like, you're pissing your pants. He's yeah. Just, yeah like an unbelievably funny person. Good person. But yeah, nothing but good things to say about, say about all those, all those folks. Cool. That's cool. That was, that was a, that was a funny run during that time. Cause I, I remember just running into you and you're just like, dude, you don't even know what the fuck the last couple of weeks <laughs> you're like, I was, I was just at Wimbledon with, with these guys and then went to Elton John's house. And then I'm like meeting all these fucking people. I'm, I'm just laughing. Cause you're just, I can just picture you in these places. Just like, like you said, like, what the fuck am I doing here? You know, how old were you? Uh, <laughs> it was, it, when was that just to gauge? I was, time? That was like uh, uh, 2009, 10, 11. So I was like 30s, early 30, like 29, 30, 31. Cool. I just turned 40 last June. So, so you could you could appreciate it. That's really neat. I could, yeah. And I because I was kind of coming up in snowboarding and maybe had a little bit like thought I was kind of cool and famous, maybe mm-hmm. in that like that genre. I was like, oh, snowboarding, I must be fucking cool. And then. I went and hung out with actual famous people and was like, oh, I'm not shit. I'm Remember so small. That. And it, it was a humbling <laughs> thing. So after that, I was always just like, no matter how famous you're getting snowboarding, like it does not matter. Yeah. You are not yeah. famous. Yeah. You're not when a you have, Like to watch, to see that kind of fame when you, like Justin would literally have goggles, a face mask on and his nose sticking out. And people are like, Justin Timberlake. I'm like, how the fuck did his little nose get recognized? on the mountain like that's fame and you watch fame like that and it spreads like a virus like you'll be in a crowd like we'd be in new york and it was almost scary because people would start recognizing him and you just see it spread through the whole restaurant or if you're on the street i remember you always had to walk fast like we'd walk down the street in new york and it was never stopping because the crowd would mob man like people would start following and it was like kind of like concerning you're yeah. Like, oh shit. Am I gonna have to like, like start beating motherfuckers here? Or like what what's gonna happen with this crowd? And so it was always like just learning these different like ways he, he navigates and that fame that is so it's like great to have that fame, but you're almost a, a prisoner to your own fame. You're not walking in the front doors of hotels, always going in uh underground parking garages, always the back doors, always leaving the ba- service elevators. Um, it's a different lifestyle, isn't it? We yeah, he's not free to roam, you know. Well, yeah. that's why that's why yeah. famous people like that hang out with other famous people. It's like yeah, like normal people can't handle those people usually. Like all the all the people that usually approach, it seems like all the people that approach famous people like that. It's like they, it's almost like they don't even have respect for the person. They just want to like something from them. Like totally. they want to take a piece of their greatness with them, like an autograph or like a handshake or, or a photo that they can photo. show on their social media yeah. and pretend like they're best buddies for, for life. Yeah. But you see autographs these, and phone shit and, and you, phones. You see this shit where people are just like forcing their way onto these people and then just like take the photo and they're like, you know, like later fuck. Th- you know, I got it. Like I don't Except need in Canada, down. they're too polite. <laughs> Mike Myers once uh, made a uh, made a comparison between when he was in the States and when he goes back home to Toronto. And he says in the States, they mob him. And when he, he goes back home to Toronto, he was uh, he got on a train by himself. And the guy beside him just looks over and goes, hey, Mike, how's your mom? <laughs> well, that's perfect. <laughs> it's good. And he's like, oh, that's good to hear. And I, that, was I, it. that was the conversation. No, I that's right. Could... To say we're not crazy because we are. I put I picture Canadian fans just walking up to someone taking a selfie and just saying sorry at the same time. Oh, but sorry. They, they do do that. sorry. I'd love to pretend that we're really calm, but <laughs> it's fame. People get weird with it. And, yeah. and really there's no snowboarders that uh it, actually I should I should stop because I bet you Sean White there is He gets uh, recognized, I'm sure. Yeah, and it might just be a small, you know, uh demographic age demographic but it's still he gets recognized because that was his that was his business model whereas like the other big guys like travis and like you know todd richards back in the day you know maybe in japan andrew andrew i have a question for you 
So your your home stopping get grounds is like Lake Louise in that area, yeah? Yes, yeah. Yeah, that I mean, dude, those mountains are well, you know, I, I make the comparison all the time. It's this it's just like you guys down there. Like when I went down to Jackson, it was I was like, this is my backyard. These are the same kind of mountains with a slightly different color to them. Like you you would be so great riding these mountains because you understand like how many rocks are under the snow and it's the same similar snowpack as Jackson. But you know what? Minus yeah, minus the glaciers. You guys have fucked glaciers. Oh, yeah, we got a lot of those. Yeah, it's nice. I actually, um, I did a trip up there um, through the Bow River Range. And, like, we we camped out in the in the Ghost River Range and then went up the Bow, rode, like, wow. Granddaddy Kular, rode um, the Silverhorn off of Athabasca, like, um, Parker, uh, is it Parker Ridge? Yeah, Parker's Ridge, and you go up yeah. Athabasca. That was some of the first photos I ever got published was from up there. So that's yeah, so man. neat that you did that. Yeah, but it's all it was, fair, fair game as well, which is great too. Yeah, but I mean, those mountains are heavy metal. Glad you, glad and, you liked it. Um, have you? I was going to ask you uh, because there, there is like uh, a riding style that I, I really appreciate your riding style. I've been following you for a long time. I don't know a lot about your, your back end of your life and your ranching and all that, but I do know about your snowboarding because I love it. I love just your balls to the wall style. And um, have you ever been to Verbier, Switzerland? I've never been to Verbier, no. Because I got to say, you would just adapt to that style of mountain riding so quickly being that you're from jackson you grew up on these like sharp jagged uh slightly covered by snow rocks and it's it's the same there only it's a free for all and it's just mountain range after mountain range and you can take a backpack and travel from town to town and never use a road like you would absolutely love it but i guess uh, yeah. On from that, and what, where have you ridden, and what were your favorite kind of and most inspiring dabbled? Oh man, I would say you know obviously first and foremost is um, around here. You know, the Tetons, the Snakes, the Salts, everything kind of in the radius of of this area. And I don't have to leave Jackson, which is or Wyoming, yeah. um, which is awesome. But I, I guess you know I have a special place in my heart for the Andes. Um, I love South America. I love Chile. Um, I've spent a lot of time down there. Um, I have some really good friends down there. Uh, that place is special. It's just like the roots of snowboarding. You know, I feel like it, it hasn't been tarnished. Uh, it's just everybody's down there uh, to ride, not for the cameras, not for the, the exposure, but just for the love of it. You know, these whole crews of like Christian and, and Manuel and Nico and Eduardo and all these guys down there that have bought sleds, they keep them at Christian's. And they, they, they go out and, and just ride, you know, like we go out and ride, but it's more like objective based, like, okay, we're working, but down there, they're just like doing all the work without, you know, it's all for them. And I always really appreciated that. And, uh, the Andes are just powerful, powerful mountains. I mean, the exposure down there is so gnarly and just riding, riding in the, in the summer for us is, is always kind of a, a nice breakup for sure. Uh, I love Europe too, you know, just the way you can move through Europe. Um, the mountain ranges are, are huge. The food, I mean, my last trip to Europe is one of my best trips I've ever had. And I brought Willie, <laughs> like we brought Willie, <laughs> called him like, I was like three days before we went. It was this Arbor trip to Austria for, uh, for this shop's first try. I think it was called, it was like this kind of demo on snow thing there. And so Gooch and I were going obviously, and I just saw Willie in the, we were having dinner one night and I was like, Hey dude, like, you want to go to Europe? And he's like, fuck yeah. And then, so we literally showed up and the reps in the Arbor reps in Altbach had no idea. I didn't even tell anybody we were bringing plus one. So that was kind of like the whole trip was like plus one because we opened the door and, uh, the rep was just like looks at our team. It's like me, Asher, Gooch, and Willie, and he goes, "Oh, plus one." I was yeah, like, but, oh, he, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but he wasn't. He wasn't. He wasn't stoked on me being there. It was really no. weird. Like I First was like, shot, "You're a maniac." <laughs> if I brought, if I like, I don't. It's kind of a weird thing. Like I think it's maybe an Austrian thing, or something. But like, I don't know. Like none of us would give a shit if Carter and Gooch 
showed up, like whoever they brought, obviously they're not going to bring some fucking tool, but like, he definitely was like, Oh, like, do I have to like get you free lift tickets and shit too? Like, do I have to like babysit you the whole time? I was like, I'll go get my own room, dude. I don't even want to just put here. your like, thumb in your mouth and I, I'm fucking I'm self sufficient, yes. dude. I don't need your help. Like, yeah. and then and then if then he I'm embraced. Like, it was embraced. If and that's then, all you got to do is meet Willie, and then you get it. And yeah. then. And then uh, I was like not drinking at the time, and I was I just looked like a fucking narc, dude, because we, <laughs> we, we rolled into the house, and like I didn't even take my coat off, and everyone's sitting around this table at the kitchen, like drinking beers and stuff. And I, I he's like, "You want a beer?" And I was like, "Nah." And I was just like in my coat because I was like, I, I don't know if I'm even so not fun to this. I'm guy. even staying tonight. Like I'm probably just gonna fucking go find another hotel. And then at one point I just cracked and was like, give me a fucking beer. And then like, got fucking hammered, took my coat off, ended up share. I always end up sharing a bed with Gooch somehow. And, like that entire trip, I got like half an hour of sleep because he just snores <laughs> through the fucking floors. Like the whole bedroom vibrates when he's. Snores. <laughs> Anyone who's ever shared a bed or a tent with Gooch knows he is the he is the him. I think maybe Perillo too. Those guys are like king of snoring, like so silicone guys. earplugs, man. That silicone doesn't even earplugs. do shit, dude. I was <laughs> silicone earplugs hoodie <laughs> over my head, three pillows stacked on. Like it doesn't matter, dude. The whole bed is fucking vibrating. You know, it's like there's nothing you can do about it. Except just wake up, wake up super grumpy in the morning. <laughs> that that was such a an awesome trip, though, man. It was. Like, it was the best. We had so much fun. Just what were the highlights? Around. The snow was the, well. The snow was like really good. We showed up and it it hadn't snowed. It, it probably hadn't snowed in like five days. But they'd just been getting pounded. They'd ha- they'd been through like a twelve foot cycle. So yeah. I think it's stabilized. And you know, in Europe, you can just get off piste and find powder for days. And so we were just like start at this little resort we were at Outback, where the shop's first try was. Um, we started dabbling and figuring that place out, and by like day two, three, we were just finding the most insane tree runs that nobody yeah. was riding. That was and, so good, dude. And wow, then we ran into Macon's. Yeah. Macon's was there, and so our other homie um, was there, and we rode with him, and just dude, we we yeah. rode with fucking Tarquin. Yeah, we, ran, we ran we ran into Tarquin there, and he took some runs with us. It was fucking nuts. Like that's weird. Yeah, that, that's it. Yeah, I mean that dude was like old old solid. Dude. Like I hadn't seen that guy since like fucking early nineties or something. Yeah, but he was so chill. Yeah, Tarquin was awesome. And then and then we went we we migrated over to Meyerhoff, and and I'll never forget. Like we roll into our bed and breakfast. We were with uh, Fishy, who's the yeah. this photographer guy over. He's awesome. And he was just kind of like facilitating our, our our accommodations and taking care of us. And we roll into this bed and breakfast at like 7.30 in the morning. And we hadn't eaten. We were all kind of like hungry. And we knew we had to go up the mountain. And we rolled into this bed and breakfast. And this, this, uh, the lady that ran it was this older gal. And she was super nice. But she just offers us schnapps. She's like, oh, yeah. schnapps? She get, she and we're all just kind of standing like, well, it's 7 30 in the morning we're like well fuck it yeah let's have some schnapps so we all took a shot of schnapps hopped on the gandhi went up to like you know ten thousand feet and had breakfast but i remember i was just like all buzzed up yeah I'm like an empty belly Same. it's the and real then, schnapps over there too homemade oh no, man that's like it's terrible dude. Ethanol. it's yeah, fucking ethanol. worst just, hangover I ever dude i i've had some of my bloodiest fucking just hell hangovers <laughs> i love fucking it you put it in your coffee but that 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 brings up europe is such a culture as well this the yeah. the mountain vibe there like you don't just go there and ride the mountains and talk about that and ignore everything else because it's how it's all pieced together is what i yeah. love about it you go halfway down the hill you need a beer you go in something called the umahuten and you get <laughs> blasted along yeah. with 60 and 70 year olds just getting blasted kilometers well, after kilometer to get back it, to their chalet the, the mountains are so big i'll never forget one day it was like we had this great day we're at the top of the Meyerhoff and like we don't know where we're at we don't know how far it is down to the bottom of the mountain it's like fucking miles and we're with mario wagner who was kind of guiding us and vole nivel he was there and beckna so we're like with the low dogs 
and we're at the top of the um the resort and we're like having a couple beers towards the end of the day we have one beer we're like oh maybe we'll have another beer we have another beer and they're like well shit i'm feeling pretty good maybe we should have another beer and vole is just like uh maybe no more beers we have a long ride home <laughs> yeah and like, it was Okay, like it's it the end of the so day, right? hard to the bottom. It was, it was so far, and then the like the last quarter mile was just like icy moguls through oh. these fucking switchback roads, and then down to the parking. Oh lot. yeah, dude, that flat light. That last stretch too, like when we got down there, it was dark, and it was like yeah. the, it was like those kind of moguls where like your board doesn't go, doesn't cut the snow at all. It's like marble, and it was just Ooh. like. It was like melted out moguls, like so. There's dirt patches everywhere, but then it, but then the moguls froze because it was just like enough to get you there, just enough snow. It was so to get sketchy, you there. and then but like and then, no problem for Vole and Beckna are just like ripping. I'm like, yes, whoa, pointing those guys it. are yeah. so good at snowboarding. Yeah, <laughs> and then and then we went to like then you get down there and they have like the gnarliest like disco tech fucking oh, opera. Yes. Where yes. it's so loud in there, you can't even order a beer. And it's like accordion like, music too, accordion techno. It was, yeah, it was, it was, it was like just, old ladies with ski boots dancing on the oh on yeah. The car. You got. Oh, I love it there. You got to sit outside. You can't. It's so hard to go in there because you're just nasty, and you go <laughs> in, and people are just been in their ski boots all day everyone stinks like shit everyone's like spilling beer on each other people are spitting oh, in your so face happy. while they're talking to you like it's so gnarly dude I fucking not hate, like here I love... in north america where you oh i gotta go get in my car now no beers i gotta drive home yeah, yeah. lame Zero however bucks. i will give you guys credit i i contributed the is it the mangy moose oh yeah I, yes that was yeah. the best at prey i experienced in North America. Oh, oh yeah. that's okay. bad. And and you know what? It, I'm not saying the mangy moose is bad because that was so much fun. We had such a blast. We had a DD. We had an Alcoholics Anonymous with us, so he was driving, and I had so much fun. And I went, "Wow, I've never experienced this in t except in Europe." And of course, there was this big long drive home back to Jackson. But um, I got to give it to you that I love Jackson for that. It was one of the only places in North America I experienced like a really good party vibe at the bottom of the hill. That's kind of the last place that like real opera is going on. Mm, Jackson yeah. still is it? I I don't know. I don't even. I, I mean, I haven't operated once this year, so I don't know. Yeah, I quit so opera. Opera got canceled. Well, Teton <laughs> Tai was cool. That's always it's always fun to get hammered there after riding. But yeah, it's like the the opera scene's like a little weird there. I I think I usually just get the fuck home after I'm done riding. Like how you the, Al the Alpenhof. Uh, yeah, well, the Alpenhof's cool too. There's actually, <laughs> there's actually, oh, remember that? They were fucking <laughs> I, throwing, I was say, hey. throwing snowballs yeah. at the, the, so the start bus, like the, the town bus or whatever, like pulls out right in front of this bar and that's kind of like up on a deck or whatever. So Jack and was that the day that Lego was there and we got fucking shit face and I like well, tomahawk into got, that snow? Yeah, <laughs> and we did the, did we... I don't remember. That was, there, was, there was a few of those blurry days that winter, but I remember that yeah. day specifically because we showed up at the Alpenhof and you were already like two or three pints deep, and we were just no, like, we're "Oh, pitchers. Cool. We were pitchers deep by the time." <laughs> and then we just up. we all kind of just Joel was there, and we all kind of just sent it, yeah, just to the to flat. Yeah, I remember uh, we were hitting some. We went. For, we we're we like hit rock springs or something well, like no, side that country. was a different time that uh, we were at the alpenhof again the same winter maybe uh, next, okay. next week but, sounds like okay. you're really drunk that winter <laughs> yeah oh <laughs> uh, well yeah. no we had like two beers then we we're like 3 30 we're like oh let's hop the last tram and it was like blake and scotty there was just a ripping crew of people there yeah and you and, felt good from those two beers it's just oh we were feeling feeling. good yeah, yeah so we just went and ripped uh uh hoback no, uh, Hobax, Hobax, North Hobax, yeah. and hit the gully, and I'll never forget watching Willie wreck, and immediately just like started laughing so hard, like lost his goggles at the bottom. It was just hitting this kicker. It was just like, oh uh, yeah, that's why you we, don't drink. We're hitting this ride. jump into this like really steep landing, and there's like this massive fucking ice cookie. It was like the size of a basketball or something, <laughs> and it was pretty flat light and. So, 
I ended up putting my nose directly <laughs> oh, underneath the thing going full speed. And I just, it slapped me down so fucking quick and just like wrecked me so bad. All I could do is fucking laugh, but I was in so <laughs> much pain, dude. Like Blake just, and I were just talking about that the other day, dude. Like really talking about that day and your wreck. Cause it was so, it's so like burned into our minds. Oh man, I'm I'm a, I'm embarrassed at some of the slams it, I've taken. Isn't off that great form. though to like see? We're always trying to go a little bigger, a little bigger, a little bigger. We're trying to go a little faster. We're trying to attack a line that's got a little more technicality to it. Why are we doing all that when all we need to do is just drink one more beer and then go and do easy shit? It's oh, just as hard. I can't I can't that anything is anymore. The future drink riding. <laughs> I, I always slept. I, <laughs> I think that I was the a, 90s, though, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah it and, was. dude, in your 40s, dude, like, I can barely fucking, like, I might have one more tomahawk left in my, for the rest of my life. Oh, like, got lost. And I think, like, I think two seasons ago, I tomahawked, like, six times, like, really bad. I'm like, I don't know, dude. You're bringing so much joy to everyone's life by the sounds of it. <laughs> it's your tomahawks. Yeah. Because, you know what, uh, Mark? That's why, like, you know, everybody's part in the 90s was like they'd go and ride up a cat track and do a 360 off the side hit. And that was like a snowboard part in the video. And it was probably because they were drunk. Let's be honest. It makes sense. So that's like hitting an 80 foot cliff now, sober. <laughs> is it is a side hit? Oh yeah, yeah. I see what you're saying. Yeah. So, it makes I sense. Mean, I mean, sense. kids, kids are still filming side hits. Like fucking, what's his name? Arthur, <laughs> Arthur man. Arthur, Ooh. dude, that's, that shit is fucking rad. I yeah, could watch, I could watch that shit. You all know day. what I love too is right away. I don't, I don't know how old you are, Mark. I didn't, I don't know uh, your age or anything, but forty. Uh, as soon as you said, I know that. I knew that exactly when you started your first story because you said I had, a, I got a black <laughs> snow, and I went. Boom, that puts you into the early 90s for starting your yep. snowboard career. And that's great. Did you it's have a black snow? You can hear like just little, little um, details and you can actually, you know, when you've done it for 30 years, you can tell exactly what, how old people totally. are or, or, or what they've done, what they've seen. So they're just little signals. It's neat. Yeah. Well, yeah. it's like, it's like kids these days that are like, my first video I saw was like, what? fucking resistance or project <laughs> resistance or something you're like uh you ain't got nothing to say Just sit the fuck down <laughs> or whatever you know <laughs> yeah Shit, as long man. as you follow them they promise you, not to clog the feed so tell us about your uh tell us about you and your brother's fucking meat company oh yeah oh yeah beef <laughs> um yeah you know we started this thing like gosh, like 2014, you know, people were always asking, you know, they kind of knew I didn't really embrace my, my ranching background because it wasn't cool in snowboarding at all. Everybody's like fucking heck, you know, you had to be cool. Like, I don't know. It just wasn't as accepted, but until I embraced that, it was really where I found like my authentic self and everything that happened from there. But like in 2014, you know, everybody, oh, I get your beef. And, you know, we sold commodity, which all ranchers do. You know, you sell your calves in the fall to a buyer and they feed them and then they sell them and they just kind of go into the, the ether of the cattle market. So you don't really, you can't track the single singular animal. Mm -hmm. um, but we saw a need for like maybe direct to consumer and just kind of cutting the middleman out. And so we started this Carter Country Meats and I'd already kind of had the brand Carter Country. Uh, Nate DeShane's actually did a story on me years ago in I snowboard that. mag yeah. and he called it carter country and i was like man that always stuck and i, I thought that was really like um a great fit and so i kind of just ran with it so we started carter country meats in 2014 just selling direct to the restaurants over here and that's kind of where we got to start you know and it was it was a lot of growing pains and just of course fuck man it's like starting any business you're like especially within the that industry is so tricky because it's already been done but my brother is such an outside of the box thinker and such a hard worker and really finger on the pulse with a lot of things that, you know, we've made it work and it's really evolved into this, you know, we really want to like kind of give back to the, the local ranchers and, and he's setting up a whole template um, of a different food system, basically like, you know, more of a, a regionally sourced, locally delivered um, 
trade system. I mean, he's building a whole butcher shop intensely. I mean, there's there's so many layers to it. But bottom line, it's like I think our food system in in the in the U.S. is so is so fucked, and mm-hmm. you know nobody talks about it. But yet, you, you know, the ranchers and the farmers are starving. Um, it's really hard to make a living at it. People are eating dog shit every day. Um, people's health is horrible. Immunity is horrible. And I think everything that's happened in the past year has really like kind of brought that to light of like how unhealthy we are. And so mm-hmm. I think food is the most important thing. And it starts with the soil, you know, with, with everything from the soil to what they eat, to the animals, regenerative um, agriculture, the, the health of the animals, the health of the, the ranchers. And it just kind of is like a trickle effect. So we're really trying to showcase that. And, um, so are you, do you guys just background or you, you birth and you background and then you used to sell to feedlot, but now yeah. are, is, is your meat all grass fed? Is that what you guys are doing? Everything's it's like, yeah, you're not going to finish them. Everything's grass fed, but everything's Amazing. finished. Um, we're using older animals with what we do. We don't use yeah. like commodity markets, 24 to 36 months. So yeah. they're basically like commodities, just like get the, get them fat the minute they're fat, yeah. kill them package them, sell them. And our idea is like these animals have such more value. And I think, you know, they taste better as they age. Um, and as long as an animal is, is fat and happy and healthy, they, they taste really amazing. But with grass, it takes more time mm-hmm. to get an animal fat, and especially, mm-hmm. you know, everybody wants to just pump, pump them full of stuff in the, in the feedlots and all that. But you know, if you give things time and you let them, and we, we use a lot of what I call an open cow. So a cow that's maybe towards the end of her, her, uh, fertility. So she, that may, for whatever reason, she didn't get bred up that year. So she didn't have a calf in her, but she was running with the whole herd, mm-hmm. but she, a calf wasn't pulling off her. So she was on the rangeland, on the grasses getting fat. And so in the fall, you can see these big, and we call them dries, a big dry cow because she doesn't have a bag on her. And there, you know, you take a cow like that, four to eight years old, and you, you know, you butcher her and it just brings a totally new realm of meat. And it's, it's healthy. Um, it just tastes better. Oh, I love that's it. Kinda, that's kind of what we're running, you know, and then we're able to go to our neighbors and buy their dries and give them a premium rather than them selling commodity yeah. on the market, selling these dry cows that are worth nothing, but yeah. they're so valuable. You can give them a premium and guarantee them a price for their cow every fall. you will buy your dries at this price. How and many, how they, many calves of the dries process? Like how many calves have they had? Six. I mean, just depending on, on the years, you know, yeah. uh, if they're four years old, they've had two cows, two, two calves. Okay. You know, so like you usually they get bred up as yearlings. And then so that coming year, they'll have a calf. Yeah. Um, and so it just kind of depends. But uh, that's what color is the fat? Color is the fat? Yeah. Well, it'll be yellow. Yes. Yellow. Like tra- it's yellow. And know, corn fat is really it's, white. It's great. Yeah. yeah. And not saying that like corn is bad. You know, I think there's a lot of like when we get it, when we start talking about monocropping and all these these, these big, this big agriculture, yes, it's, it's super bad, but yeah. there is ways to feed cattle grain that isn't bad. It's really demonized, but I mean, it's an amazing flavor as well, but I think we're it's so on the feedlot this, um, format that, that demonizes it more. It's just sticking them in a holding cell, not letting them move yeah. and feeding them for whatever the three or four months until they make weight. Like, I think you guys still, you still let your cows walk around, you're feeding them yeah, I mean, they, 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 they migrate with the grasses, you know, so like we put so my brother perfect. and my brother's like, he's the ground zero. He does all the work on the ranch. Like I fill in where I can, but I mean, RC is like, he runs the shit. It's his, his vision. So cool. I help facilitate with my connections and try to get eyes and on the platform. And I know, I know quite a bit about it. Cause I've been grown, I've grown up with it, but RC is the visionary of all of this. And, and my grandpa was the start and then my dad and then not RC to see it all come full circle. But I think it's just, you know, it's really important to, to, to talk about food and, and especially mm-hmm. in the state of our world. And, you know, n- nobody's talking about immunity and nutrition and, 
everything's so demonized and like you know it, it doesn't matter what like what like from uh agriculture to like well from farming to like you know ranching there's there's great practices within it and there's really bad practices within it but you got to kind of like put your finger on the pulse to understand what's good and what's bad i mean all the all the government subsidized corn and ethanol bullshit that's super bad for our environment super bad like i think a third of the the world's pollution comes from monocropping and 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 these big agriculture and uh, you know that's demonized but there's so many little gems within it um within farming and ranching that people are doing it right and i mean that's what this what our country was built upon is like these this hard work of people like hands in the soil and I don't believe that like the farmers do this to be to be malicious in any way, but they're of just course. trying to make uh, make a living. And so like all they know, all they've been taught is to put fucking glyphosate and round up ready crops because they're going to get a bigger yield. They're going to make more money. But if we could take that away and we can actually put value on um, this food that doesn't. Need You're talking about round talking about flipping the crops more because I know the United States doesn't flip crops. They do corn for a hundred years if that if the soil can allow it. Are you talking about creating uh, or educating farmers on how to maybe do a rye crop or a wheat crop or a rape, well, yeah, it's, you know, it's, rapeseed it's crop? All, it's all about the soil and the healthy yeah. soil. And within the top two inches is where all the we're all we the owe life to it. live. Yeah, we owe yeah, life that's, to the top and, two And, and you know, all, all these dudes are doing is mining soils. You know, I watch it with all the ranches, or not with all the ranches, but a lot of farms and these big monocropping uh, outfits. Is, it's just mining because they're tilling the soil. They're killing all the microbes. They're then having to put all this fertilizer and all this bullshit mm -hmm. into the soil, which is leached into the fucking water, which is then into the ocean, into the rivers. It's like, you know, they're finding out all the glyphosate that has been used in all these fertilizers. Dude, this shit is so toxic. There's a reason we have mental health issues. Everybody's biomes, uh, microbiome systems fucked up. Mm. It's because all the chemicals we put in, we absorb. Like, we're amazing creatures. And, like, if we if we consume healthy things and, and, and germs and bacteria and viruses, like, that's normal for the body. Like, our, it... it it updates our systems, but chemicals are, are not, it's so foreign to us. And it, you know, there's a reason like we have all these problems and it's getting in the younger and younger generations because, mm -hmm. you know, these big companies make money and it's all, and I, I don't think capital capitalism is a bad thing, but it can be. And, you know, obviously these companies are making a ton of fucking money off of poisoning people. And yeah, they're not going to stop until there's a reason. No, to. I mean, money is just turning the wheel and until like people start taking it back for themselves. Um, so it, what, it, it won't change. I'm sorry to cut you off there. Yeah. What is what, like, what is your harvest? How many animals uh, is Carter country harvesting a year? Like how much are I mean, you it, contributing to it, the area? Cause I love how you're living your you know, paying your bills, obviously off the cattle. And then you're also getting this, getting to be a snowboarder in that same area. That's like a nice sustainable. Yeah, know, it's sustainable. I mean, it's, it's growing. Life, I, I, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head, like how many cows we, we say we butchered last year, but yeah. it's over a hundred, over a hundred. Oh, wow. um, and then we have like our online store now that we're selling direct, which really kind of changed the game. And and we launched that online store uh, right in March, like unknowing what coming down the pipe, you know, with COVID mm -hmm. and all the all the restrictions and lockdown. So it was really good timing for us um, mm -hmm. to do that. But I still think like the 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 best system is going to be, you know, setting these hubs up in certain areas where you can source animals from the ranchers there. They don't have to travel across the country. Mm -hmm. They go right here, they're butchered, and they're picked up in the same spot. You know, you can cut all these ties. And we really noticed a difference in the agriculture, especially in the beef business. In about 2015, they, the USDA uh, deregulated country of origin. So basically, once they deregulated country of origin, so they used to always have to label, like if you went to the store, you would see uh, like a package of beef, and it's a product of Brazil, product yeah. of Uruguay. Or whatever, but they deregulated that. Um, 
84% of the USDA processing plants in the US are owned by uh, South America, the J JBS. Um, so they control everything. And a lot of Australian and, beef as well, right? Brazilian and Australian beef. Yeah, all that stuff. And so that really opened the economy that devalued all the American beef. Listen, we got enough beef in this country. We don't need yeah. to import beef. And it's yeah. better beef somebody, it's the Taurus. Yeah, it's, well, somebody's it's not getting that. rich and, and nothing's regulated down there. I'm not saying that South American beef is, isn't bad, but when you incentivize mm -hmm. um, uh, all this beef to be imported and open this, this floodgate, which has happened, it, and, and I can't blame the South Americans, but they start, you know, agriculture is a huge part of the, the rainforest being cut down to make more room for agriculture and beef. And we're, and that's like, if you're buying um, just commercial beef, you're kind of part of the problem. And people don't realize that, but like, yeah. that's a huge fucking problem. But our government needs to like deregulate that or regulate that and give the, give the, the power back to the ranchers and the farmers and, you know, like make it lucrative for the ranchers and the farmers to be able to, to make a living on their ranch. I mean, I watch my nicking starving because they can't make any money. And I, like food is so important. And is that, is that um, factory farming? That's kind of killing the small rancher. Yeah. It's all that. It's uh, it's, and of it's, course it's, the it's, imports and yeah. Imports. Um, just the big guy coming in and squishing out the little guy, which we've seen. I mean, this is the biggest transition of wealth ever in human history. We've watched all these mom and pop from, from ranchers to farmers to like all these small stores just be crushed. But yet Amazon target, like everybody's ordering that. And you, I look at that and I'm like, that's no fucking, that's, that's not a coincidence. Yeah. Yeah. Like the billionaires are getting richer, but like these people that are boots on the ground that have like really like built this country. It's, it's going away and I don't know how it's going to come back until people really start waking up and like, and for, you know, getting information and, and, and teaching themselves on these and what's happening. And it's, it's pretty scary, you know, just from what I see, the small business is going away and because it's so easy. I, I'm part of the problem, dude. I'll fucking order off Amazon. It's like, you know, it's easy. It's convenient. You push a button and it's harder to go down to your local store or your local butcher shop and give them your dollar. But like, man, like that's what's going to change the tide is like giving your money, keeping it local, giving it to the people that work for it. You know, Absolutely. not these billionaires that are just like, they don't give a fuck about you. You know, what they're just have, like, like what would have, I got two questions. What would have happened to that, to that beef that you guys are harvesting? Uh, where would that have gone? Would that have just been ground up into hot dogs or would have been just more than, more than likely um, the older beef, you know, they sell it at the sale barn. Um, for cheap um because which is it's crazy because it's not bad beef at all it's just there's a stigma that it's there not is. the thing, a one the, year thing old. About, the thing about an animal the thing that makes animals taste good is like if they're fat and healthy if a, if a cow's skinny and that's why gr uh grass-fed beef has such kind of like a a little bit of a bad reputation as far as taste goes because they're mm -hmm. it's usually kind of tough and gamey it's because they're not fat they're not it's because it, it takes time to get fat. And if you put an animal in a feedlot and try to pump grass into it, you're going to spend a lot of money. You're not going to make any money on that animal. You mm -hmm. know, so it's like that's why you go get a grass fed steak and you're kind of disappointed. You're like, fuck, I wasn't that. That's kind of. Yeah, but then you shooting. guys, you guys, then you guys finish them with corn, right? Or no, or with everything's that. grass fed. No more grain. Uh, um, everything is grass fed, but they're really fat. And it comes back yeah. to those dry cows. Um, they're fat and they're, and they're just healthy, healthy cows. Yeah. And you, and you we, mean, when you say dry cow, you mean like, it's not, it's not like, yeah, she uh, didn't have it's a baby. Not feeding, it's not feeding a calf. Yeah. So she didn't okay. have a calf pulling off her. Cause that takes a gotcha. lot of energy and not yeah. saying the cows that have a calf on them aren't healthy. They're not going to be as fat because they're, they're putting it all too. into their calf. Yeah. 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 And they still look good, but you see a dry cow. I can look at a herd of cows and I can spot the dries just by the way they look. You can see them. They're just, yeah. they don't have a bag and they're fat. They bulk you know? up way quicker. Yeah. They're keeping see, all the calories on. I wonder why, you know, like the smaller farming and ranching and stuff isn't subsidized by the government. You know, it's like they subsidize, you know, throwing black people in fucking prison. It's like, yeah. why don't they subsidize these small ranchers well, and shit? 
you know they 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 have had some uh, some subsidies over the past year um definitely for for small ranches for sure and i and the government did a pretty good job but okay still the amount of money we're talking about they're it's not they going to save the farm, yeah. They put trillions of dollars into this bullshit. But yeah. still, it's not saving, you know, $50,000 for a ranch might not even, it's not even going to cover the operating costs for that year, you know? Yeah, yeah. So it's like bringing the value back into the food, and it starts with the soil. But if you are selling your beef locally, there's not as many, like, barriers. You're not spending as much yeah. money to ship it. And you're kind of taking it out of the hands of the pro and the processors, you know, and processors like JBS, these big processors. So just to kind of put a little like context to it, a rancher will hold his cow its whole life, feed it, um, take care of it and make maybe $100 on it, maybe $200 on it on a good year. The processor gets that animal and holds it for two weeks and it'll make seven, eight hundred, nine hundred dollars off one animal. So they're just a revolving door. Yeah. And that's the problem is it's not a fair balance. You know, if the processor, it, if it was fair there and they were giving the money to the rancher, but it's like anytime you have bureaucracy within these, these systems, I'm a, I've been a, I've always been a critical thinker. I, I was raised to always ask questions. You know, I'm like, why? And when, motherfuckers start telling you to quit asking questions and just like that raises a lot of red flags for me. And like, I don't trust necessarily trust our government. You know, I've been through some shit and I I've seen a lot of things and, and, and as a rancher dealing with, um, dealing with the government, um, on a first hand basis, whether it be the forest service or the BLM, we have a great relationship with our BLM range manager and, and but it, it just varies to where you go. And, you know, People, it's so easy for people to say, well, you know, uh, trust, tr you know, ranchers must be conservatives and they don't trust the government. They're fucking conspiracy theorists. But these guys deal with the government on a firsthand basis. A lot of people don't have to deal with that. So there is reason for them to have concern and, and ask questions because shit, man, they've seen generations of this stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's like, I, I always like to look at it from, from both perspectives and, and have a, I mean, how can you form an opinion if you live in an echo chamber? You know, it's like, yeah. I want to know what everybody's thinking. And then I form my own opinion and I think about it. And I, and I, and I get my information, not from the mainstream media, but I get it from the people, the boots on the ground that actually like will tell you the truth because man, we've been, we've been just like so misinformed. There's so much information out there that it's really hard to decipher like what the fuck is happening. And I think everybody's kind of in that like, uh, you know, confused state of knowing and being in segregation and i'm like man listen to the people that have been there and have an opinion because they know the experts like don't listen to the people that are profiting like it's always yeah. easy to if you want to know you can always track the money and that'll tell you the answer like, like track the money man like it's easy <laughs> like who's getting paid okay what are their interests what are their intentions i'm like okay shysters but you know, all you can do is what you can do and, and, and just kind of think for yourself, you know, and, and make your own decisions and, uh, you know, exactly, like, you know, and like, that's how you got is your gut, man, dude, the gut, man, that is, and that good thing to the gut is like your microbial system in your gut is the most important fucking thing. They're finding yeah. out like this dude, uh, uh there's this that's doctor, so Zach Bush, Zach Bush. And he's like, he, he was an oncologist, um, treating cancer patients and all this crazy shit, but he has studied uh, your your microbiome in your gut and how important that is for immunity, for mental health, for just like your whole system of like running clean. But all, all the past thirty years of all the glyphosates and shit being put into put into our our food system has really changed and fucked up that microbiome. And so like, and it starts with the soil, you know. And it's just like if you ever get a chance, like Zach Bush, man, if you want to know like some some uh some knowledge like that dude is throwing it down it's well there great. there's there's people are pretty convinced that the mind is actually in the stomach now like there's it been a, there's it been a is. lot of people uh coming out with that kind of yeah well there's like, so there's over a million different microbiome in the human stomach and and it's how 
that processes all the food and how it works together and how it fights itself. And it's a, it's an interesting world. I well, love it, that you're talking about that. Yeah, right now. it controls your moods. It's fucking yeah. your health. Your yeah, mind. your health oh. ma- mainly even, which even, way you control e- your mood. Even your decisions. You know your yeah. stomach. Your well, stomach. Everybody, decisions. everybody's so scared of germs and viruses and bacteria. Dude, we are made up of this shit. Like, we are made up of viruses. Like, there's different bacteria from my nose to my cheekbone. Like, it, we're covered in this stuff. Like, our, our epidermis is the biggest organ of the body. And I think, you know, to... I was having this, like, fucked up allergic reaction. I was trying to figure out, like, last spring, because, you know, COVID hit, and everybody's like, fucking hand sanitizer. And everybody's just like... And I grew up in a world where I would, like, work all day with my dirty hands, working with animals... And, 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 shit eat, in your mouth. and eat and we didn't wash our hands man we were around animals we were around dirt and i never yeah. get sick you know i can like my body's been imprinted and and updated with all those bacteria. and the minute you cut that off and the minute you start sanitizing everything is the minute everybody starts getting sick because your body does not it can't decipher between good and bad bacteria anymore and that's what's happening you know like i was noticing just personally i was using hands sanitizer i was getting these weird fucking reactions in my throat and like i was just like my system was just fucked up and i thought i had like throat cancer dude i was like oh god and i'm I'm a rancher i won't go to the doctor i'm just like oh, i'll just fucking die whatever dude i'll just <laughs> run it out something will happen and uh i quit using hand sanitizer because my body is like and, and, and granted like obviously if i'm in an airport around people in a bathroom i'm gonna wash my hands with soap like of course I don't want to. I don't want to catch some fucking conjectivitis, fucking pink eye or some shit, you know. But like the minute we sanitize everything, is the minute the kids and everybody's gonna start getting super sick. And like, it's just a band aid, man. Like everybody's like clean. It's like this Purell culture of like yeah. germs are bad. I'm like, nah, man. If you grew up like, if you understand how the how the body works and how our systems how amazing our our, our our systems are like dude you want the germs you want the bacteria you want the viruses because then you update and your some, body is like understanding how to work through this you shit. want you want some of that stuff like i would say like you know like surviving fucking dengue and covid like i don't want either again no like, but he's not he's talking bacteria but but, but i i know what you're but, talking about as far as but like, like if your if your immunity's never fucking challenged, it's kind of like a kid that's grown up around a bunch of like Nerf like yeah. baseballs and fucking like they gotta wear a helmet like when they walk to school, you know, like or or just kids that are like protected from curse words or like this or that. It's like you're not yeah. preparing people for the real world, and it goes the same with like bacteria and all this stuff. Like if you hide in your fucking hide in your house all the time, and, like. Yeah. Yeah. Don't expose any of this shit. Like you're, I mean, you're, you're a boy in a bubble. Like you're it's fucked. truly. And, and, and that stuff, like if you catch COVID and you have been clean and sanitized, that shit's going to fuck you up. But if you have been out breathing fresh air and like, viruses are fucking everywhere, man, like germs are everywhere and it's natural. It's our natural environment. And to think that like COVID is the, the last virus to come down the pipeline, like, Dude, there's worse shit coming. Like, I don't care. Like, this is not the zombie apocalypse. Like, you have a very small percentage of dying from this shit. It's bad. Like, nobody wants to catch that shit. You went through it, Willie. But, like, if your body had never been exposed to germs or bacteria, dude, it's going to slap you really hard. And so I'm, I'm all about just, like, man, let's not live in fear, but let's, like, live educated. Let's, let's, let's expose ourselves to bacteria healthy bacteria and germs it's like it's normal like don't be sanitizing everything around because and don't be in your house all the fucking time because man it's a matter of time like there's no stopping a virus there's just no stopping it it's going to do what it wants to do and it's like mother nature she's going to do what she wants to do and yeah. if if you're not prepared if your body has not been prepared to take a beating it's gonna it's gonna be worse for you, you know. But it just depends. It depends though, because like it's more complicated than that. Because like if you get if you get dengue twice, you have like a ninety percent chance of dying. Well, like, dengue's fucked. Yeah, 
but like you know <laughs> and and we don't really know you don't really know how covid's going to affect you until you get it you know like there's there's fucking 20 year olds with no underlying conditions that are dying from it it's so fucking random like you don't know and that's the thing that's why i'm like just don't try to get it because you you no, might I, not you're either gonna not know you have it and you're gonna spread it to everybody or you're gonna get you know you're gonna go to the er or you know yeah, or somewhere and, in between I mean, there's a chance there's a chance you know but there's a very small chance but it all comes back to the food system and being healthy yeah. and it, it co- what COVID has done is really expose how unhealthy yeah. they're finding that like you know there's been we've been in this shit for what 10 months now there's data statistics i mean we have numbers if now. you're a health if you're a healthy adult your chance of dying from covid is very slim very slim yeah. but i've never lived my life like i do dangerous shit my i've done dangerous shit my whole life to to catch covid i'm not trying to um expose anyone to it it's there it's real i i totally agree with all of that but like i i'm not gonna live in fear man i'm gonna just do everything i can do to be healthy and 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 try to get good food to people and and treat about nutrition and immunity and all these things that like our government wasn't talking about out the gate i'm just like all they were telling us is to sanitize stay away from each other and i understand that like we kind of had to get ahead of it and see what was going to happen. Now we know it's going to happen, but now it's time to like, we got to make a move. We can't just hide in our basements. We can't Prepared. let all these small businesses, just like these people that have worked their whole lives to just destroy everything. Yeah. And it's so easy if you have a job and I'm one of those people, I don't need to go outside. I have a job where I can work remotely or do whatever, but I know so many fucking blue collar people that have lost everything that, that don't have that that uh that you know yeah uh, whoa we got a phone call so uh. so let me ask you a question mark uh what markets is your uh is your beef in are you kind uh, of regional are you local how can people get in touch with you for that um, um Car- carter country meets carter country meets uh it's our, it's our online store it's carter country meets we do a bunch of stuff on the front range um in denver Obviously, everything has kind of been shut down. Like I've mm-hmm. seen restaurants um, through this whole pandemic. I've seen restaurants just shut down, and I, I feel for that restaurant industry, yeah. man. I mean, to watch to watch it shut down and and like these restaurants that'll never come back is really sad. Um, but for us, like I said, my brother's trying to do some stuff locally intensely, which we just he man, like you said, he's he's a mover and a shaker. He, he can put way more irons in the fire than I can. Uh, but he built a butcher shop there processing. We're going to have a processing plant there. Um, that's, that's the idea. Ten sleeps ground zero for, for food. Cause I mean, you only have one problem when you're hungry. You know, we, we deal with this world of like all these materialists. It's all bullshit, man. Like go out and like, just like be present and get out in nature. And, and I mean, there's so much more important things than worrying about how many likes you get on Instagram or, or whatever. And I, I understand that like social media is a great tool, but it's a tool and like, do not get sucked down the rabbit hole because that shit's like fucking depressing. You yeah, start like fo- FOMO and worry about what everybody else is doing. I was like, man, I took some good advice from Gooch early and early in my career. He's like, yeah, you'd be out there filming and, you know, maybe you weren't getting shots, but he's like, don't worry about what everybody else is doing. Just focus on your own program, you know? And I was just like, whoa, okay, cool. And I mean, that's all you can do. And I mean, it's easier said than done. I mean, it's like, you know, we're we all, live in this world of technology. Yeah, all Everybody's, but I've really been lately, like if I wasn't in the pro snowboarder and I wasn't in this position where I, I, you know, my sponsors definitely like want me to be, on Instagram because they can they can watch the analytics and they can quantify my likes and all this shit. <laughs> but dude, I would fucking throw this phone into the river. I would get a house phone. I'd get I'd have a laptop. That's all. I'd be like, well, I want to take really my I want to take phone. my time back. <laughs> I know, obviously. <laughs> That's I love I'm, that, dude. We idolize you, Willie. You you threw your phone out. I can't right? I can't take the credit for it. This is, this is my, my it's this I'm at my parents' house. She's like cool. they, 
She's so I, cool. I wish you guys could see their TVs. They're like, they have TVs that are like this big. You got to get up and change the channel. <laughs> you turn it. <laughs> well, well, let's touch base on that because I know that that's one of your philosophies, Mark. And and we're we're all we're all trying to go back to what the good life we had before all this technology. I'm not hating on technology either. I love it. No. I'm an Instagram guy too. Of but course. we are trying to go, wait, what the fuck is wrong with us? And we're slowly becoming aware that it's the speed that technology is, is forcing us to run at. And like, there's people who are turning their laptops, they're, they're digitally creating a typewriter and attaching their typewriter to their screen so that they can just typewriter. Now they want to go Dude. back. And the old way is the new way, man. And, and that's why I have faith in our in our in our our society because the pendulum always swings one way or the other, right? And I think it swung so fucking hard to the left and and technology that it's gonna swing the other way and it's gonna swing back to like uh, it's gonna be silly, like typewriter. Yeah, man, like oil lamps and fucking writing in your book and I mean. I, I, I have a wood stove in my house in Ten Sleep and I have an oil lamp. And every morning this fall, I just, you know, light up my oil lamp and I sit there and I'd read or write in front of my wood stove. And it's like, there's something very, I don't know, just it's nostalgic, but it's just like this primal, like, it's pure, pure. just like it's ritual. It's, it's ritual. And there's no like distractions. Thing, yeah. I love to watch fire. I love to create fire. Um, kind of a pyro. But, you know, I have faith in everybody, you know, we're, we're, we're resilient creatures. And I think that, you know, if you watch them, if you watch the news, it's just like, it gives you no hope. But if you watch humans, I really truly think that everybody can get along, no matter who you are, what walk of life you're from. If you just sit down and have a conversation and you respect the other and you're kind and, and that's all it takes. It doesn't matter where you come from. Like, leave the judgment behind and just like accept people for who they are, you know, cause we're all different and we're so, we're so diverse and, and resilient. And I, I just have a lot of, a lot of faith in, in our, in our society to back around, you know, we have such separation and segregation. And I just, I know that, I know that it's going to come around cause it's swung so far one way that it has to come back the other way. And I, wherever that, whenever that is, wherever it comes, I mean, I'm always kind of want to uh, hope for the, you know, prepare for the worst, hope for the best. But, you know, I always know that, like, I can just go home and start a wood fire and sit by my oil lamp and everything will be OK. So it's like whatever happens, man, I'm, I'm so fortunate to just like live this live this fucking entitled life of snowboarding and getting paid to snowboard. Not saying I didn't work my ass off for it, but like I watch people like I grew up blue collar. I watch people that fucking work for a living and they get up and and. And they have they have to go to work. They have to do these things because they have to survive. And I have to do some things, but I get to choose what I get to do. And that was the risks that I took early on. And not saying that I'm lucky. I hate when people say you're lucky. It's like, yeah, I saw opportunity and I jumped at those opportunities. Maybe some people didn't get the opportunities that I was given, but I came from a very unlikely place to be where I'm at. So there was some hard work involved in there somewhere and some I somewhat good decisions made but I think just to inspire people to be like you know everybody wants to tell everybody what to do and I was like hey man let people do what they want to do like don't tell everybody what to do it's like the old lady that wants to tell you like you can't do that I was like what well, what, what are you going to do I'm going to fucking do the exact opposite of what you just told me to do and well, there's no like, way of <laughs> Yeah, it's we're like, all guided you... by the information we have and we have had access to and we've learned. It's it's funny when people think that their set of, you know, education and information somehow uh, should, should yeah. persuade somebody else's judgment. So uh, we're, we're such a nuance. You know, there's so many nuances within uh, uh, humans and we're such amazing creatures. And like to generalize and assume and put people in boxes is just like it's it's it doesn't help. You know, because th there's so many layers to us and you just got to really, I, I don't know, I try to put myself in other people's shoes and just to see why they think that way and, and why, why that is the way they think, obviously, but mm -hmm. like, I don't know, that's all you can do. You know, I can try to grow as a human and, and 
always try to just think beyond of what I'm feeling, you know, and, and take my ego out of it. Obviously we all have fucking egos. I'm a pro snowboarder and I'm, I can be a bitch sometimes, but it's like <laughs> to be aware of that part of you and to like, at least put that in check from time to time be like, all right, uh, this is why I'm feeling this way. Cause I'm being, I'm, that's my pride getting, getting bruised. And it's not really a personal attack, but it was just like, get over it, move on. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? That well, is a very grounded way to think. It's just like, it's just like laziness to not want to have your mind open, you know, like, you know, you meet someone that's way different from you. Like that's a, that's valuable. Like they have a lot to teach you that you'll never and like, They've encountered a lot of things you'll never encounter. Like they have perspectives that they could, that you could, you know, borrow from them and add to your life. And it's like when people just close it off and they're just like, you know, just like this, you know, we've all grown up. I mean, you know, we grew up in small towns as skateboarders, like everyone fucking hates you. You know, it's like you get, you get no respect from anybody. And it's like, I don't know if these people would just sit down and have a conversation. They'd realize, I mean, obviously it's more accepted now, but. Do you know what I love about that, Willie? Is I don't know if you guys saw this. uh, I got to take this to social media for a sec because I just saw this hilarious thing. But it's these kids who are playing hockey in Calgary and the cops came because you weren't, they, they just closed all outdoor gatherings. And the cops are pinning these like 16 year olds down and like treating them like shit. And they're all, of course, these kids are just lipping off. Fuck you. <laughs> and because that's what you do when you're 16. And they're actually being arrested in their skates for going and playing hockey on the back <laughs> on in downtown Calgary. And I loved it because, like, everybody's outraged. The comments are like, fucking what the fuck is happening? But I was like, this is skateboarding in the 90s. This yeah. is exactly what it was like. I, call, I had to comment on that. I never get involved in those comments, yeah. you know, bits. But I'm like, well, I this mean, this looks exactly like how skateboarders were treated for going out and skateboarding on something. Attack. You know, I, can't attack. Believe, I can't believe that cop didn't get those cops and get like hung in the town square for well, like they don't fast rising. we we actually like our cops up here i think for the most part i mean there's problems and there's there's some of the same stuff going on down south as well there you never escape that but generally speaking they probably didn't really want to go and arrest those kids <laughs> I, i'm just i'm just talking more about how like Canadians fucking love hockey so much. It's oh, like, you think you know, these, uh, be like, I'd rather watch them play than watch you work, buddy. Well, just like be a zombie apocalypse, and they're like, don't cancel hockey. We're good. Uh, yeah, it. like yeah. Well, they didn't. Here's the thing. Now Canada, the NHL, we're just we have a Canadian league now. All the Canadian NHL teams are playing themselves this year. They're not crossing the border. That's the league. That's how important it is. No other sport is allowed to happen up here except for that. I love that. That's, that's awesome. That's what I'm saying. That's why, like, you know, you nailed it. <laughs> these cops, like, they people are probably so pissed at these cops are fucking with these kids who just yeah, who they'll never play hockey. You know, down. I'm sure they're all like, <laughs> oh god, why did why did our chief make us go and arrest those kids? Like you said, man, those cops don't want to be out there arresting no. kids, you know. But it's their job. It's their livelihood. And yeah, and they, you come they to they a point where you're like, cake. you're gonna arrest them. Yeah, yeah, but you come to a point where you're like, you know your ethics and your boundaries come to this point where you're like, it's my job or it's like, do I stand up for what I believe in? Like, I know I probably shouldn't do this. Mm-hmm. And to just like, like, like we say down in the States, like we, you know, there was, you know, the thing about all the police officers and everything that was going on, you know, like, obviously like that was concerning because that was just putting everybody in a box again and mm-hmm. generalizing yeah. and yeah, saying all oh, cops are bad. I'm like, that's like yeah. saying all people are bad. That's like saying, you know, it's crazy. And, and there's so many layers. It's like, dude, of course, there's some fucking assholes out there. We've all met them. Of course, those are the guys that go do some stupid fucking shit and then make everybody look bad. It's just like the skateboarders, you know, like mm-hmm. you had the one friend that would go make everybody bad. you know, it's like, God, maybe, well, yeah. maybe not skateboarders <laughs> isn't great because we were all trying to make each other. We didn't give a fuck. Like, yeah, I mean, that's those are the boundaries we push when we're that age. That's how we learn to be nice people is we're assholes. Yeah. And that's it's, how we learn not to bully people is by bullying. It, it's like, yeah. yeah, it's important. And plus that video didn't show 
those cops probably walk up and go, hey, boys, wrap it up. You can't be here. You know that. And then, no, fuck every, you, pig! Everything's <laughs> edited out of context now. They just want to get the fucking course. everyone fired up. But it just, it all just comes down to the approach. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I don't care if you're a cop or anybody. Like, if you approach me with respect, then I'm going to give that back. If you come in hot and start, like, fucking, oh, I agree. like, trying to dominate That's me right off the bat, like, you're going to, I'm going to be the biggest problem Party. fucking ever for you, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, but these people that are like defund the police, like they need to go. There's this documentary that I just saw that's on, uh, it's on Seattle and how like oh. Seattle's just fucking falling apart right now. Like go watch that and tell me that you don't want yeah. cops. Like I know. They, they're letting everything fly in Seattle, dude. It's fuck, dude. It is full on fucking anarchy there. Some like, somebody needs to do that though. Somebody needs just to, to show that. us. Yeah. Fuck everyone, kid. This is what's scary. Happens. We need we a thorough cop. Too many, of dude. Them. It's I know they like this poor that poor city, man. Those poor people that live there. Um, I mean, law and order. Uh, there's a reason we have law and order, man. And like well, I've always been. To. Yeah, I I broke the law. I've never been a real law by you know. I just like grew up kind of like do what you want, but never anything like really bad and malicious. But yeah. you know, it's like any rebellious kid is like, fuck that, dude. Like, well, you you skip the arbitrary laws, you know, like the yeah. ones that don't really matter. But it's like <laughs> whole anarchy in the streets where people are dude. just like you're you're fucked. People are scared and. See yeah, like people don't even want to live there anymore. Like, I don't know. According to this documentary, I mean, it seemed legit. Will, like, Willie I don't know. Mass exodus. Willie and I had a conversation about how, uh, Mark, you're, pro you're from kind of a lawless uh, upbringing. You never had cops near you. You could get away with way more than other people could. And yeah, we, I all, mean, we all know people like that. And they were always a little more <laughs> rough around the edges. I, I and I come from a culture where we don't really like being told what to do because yeah. you know, we're, we're just to be sustain ourselves. We take care of ourselves. Yeah. If there was a, if there was a fight at the bar, like it was handled by us. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like nobody came in to like handle it. Nothing got out of hand. You know, there was never, we, we self-governed, I guess. Um, yeah. And, and like, we what did have a challenge. Is, sure. Yeah. Oh man, it was amazing. Those times are gone. Like our sheriff, our local sheriff, we did have a sheriff, Bill. And, he was our football coach too. So it was like, there was like, you could kind of just do whatever you wanted. Bill, he, he didn't let it, he would check us when we got out of hand, but mm -hmm. he was there to help us and protect us because, you know, he was the kind of cop that would tell us to like, Hey, if you guys, he knew we were going to go do fuckery, but he, <laughs> he knew that like, if he had a relationship with us, None of us would die and do stupid shit because he's like, I will come pick you guys up if you guys get obliterated. Like, yeah, and that's how it know. should be, man. That's what it should be. It should it was be a close like connection that. with the with the, the yeah. authority, and that's but, uh, yeah. There's such a disconnect the there where people just ha can't live a, a minute in someone else's shoes, and they have all these stigmas and stereotypes that they grew up with. And I, I mean, fuck, we're talking and about think, a philosophy here. That I think social media has really fueled the fire for all that because now everybody has an opinion. Mm -hmm. And it used to be like you had an opinion if you were like kind of credited to have an opinion. Like yeah. to work. Now there's just it. a bunch of fucking dummies out there, dum dums, just like I I think this way. You're like the earth is flat. You're like oh my god. Well, they no. eat a Big Mac. They're like time to get my opinion out there. Yeah, know. you know. And and I, I think when people genius. when people are just angry and 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 pissed and and lashing out, they're just in pain. You know that. Yeah. I really look at it as they're not happy people, and, and I wish that I hope that they find that um, that happiness and whatever life ch ch changes they have to make, whether it be their diet or the, the quit drinking or quit smoking so much crack. I don't know what it is, but like you gotta like be um, accountable for your actions at some point, and you gotta make a change. Yeah. And um, you can't and, blame you everybody else. Rock bottom. Do you know? Do you um, know what I always use as an example of? of that, like a perfect example that just makes so much sense is there, I went on TripAdvisor the other day and that's, it, it, you guys know what that is, of course, yeah. that, that cross borders. Um, and McDonald's has 53,000 comments and <laughs> votes. And it's all negative. They got like a 52%. Mm -hmm. Don't get me wrong. I love McDonald's, but you, 
everyone in the world knows what they're going to get when they go to McDonald's. You don't need to take your time and make sure and think that everyone else is so stupid that they don't know what McDonald's is. <laughs> yeah. fucking sucks. Well, beef is shit. And the fucking chicken's made of slime. And shut <laughs> the fuck up. You don't know more about McDonald's than the rest of the world. That's a perfect example. 53,000. Wow. Used on Banff McDonald's. Well, Just dude, like, I bring it down like anyone's going to go, hey, oh. I've heard of this good Scottish restaurant, McDonald's. Let's have a quick look. Oh, it's terrible. Yeah. <laughs> how, many, how, many time, how many times have you driven by a McDonald's and seen like a huge line in the drive through and you're just like really judgy or like, look at those fucking unhealthy fat losers all waiting in line to eat at McDonald's. And then like three days later, you're in the line getting fucking cheeseburgers. Three days later, you're passed out with uh, ketchup in your navel, sweet and sour sauce in between your pecs and a whole bunch of fries and you wake up in the morning. Hey man, it's the balance. McDonald's yeah. tastes fucking good, dude, but you can't counter this it's food. Treat. It's That's the only thing. Is, it is food. That's just, the thing. It's all food. It's all calories. It filler. keeps you alive, and being alive is healthy. Therefore, McDonald's is healthy. But <laughs> eating one thing is not a good You should practice. be a lawyer. You can't not eat there all the time. You know, it's the microbiome. I always go back to that, too. It's you're not. You're never going to have a healthy gut biome if you just eat two things. You need everything. You need a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And it's a treat. McDonald's is a treat. Like, save it for that hungover yeah. morning or just like, fuck it. You gotta I shock the system from time to time. Drive a couple Big Macs down my throat. You gotta <laughs> well, shock. That's, that's what uh, Laird, is it? I think it's Laird Hamilton who mm -hmm. says, you know, he's like, you gotta eat McDonald's every once in a while just to like it's challenge your immune system, you know? You know, yeah, like what Carter was saying, you gotta. Like, Hang, hanging out with some of our friends sometimes you know you got to challenge your immune system like in, in these ski towns you got these friends that like fucking party every night and they always have like a slight cold or like they're just slightly <laughs> sick all the time and but no, they're I always play. around they're it's always hanging cold. out with people they're always sharing joints with people all that stuff oh. like, yeah. It's just a perpetual yeah. virus, but that is what's keeping us healthy, probably. Yeah, it's constantly having the anti, you know, antigens. So to genetic fight updates. Them. You got to update. It's, it's necessary you know, I to, to go have back those to spreaders out there. I want to just quickly go back to Austria because I want to quickly say this: they deserve a little bit of credit. And we were talking about Meyerhofen, and uh, last time I was at Meyerhofen, uh, my. I followed my cameraman down that terrible run, the very last one down to the bottom, the snake run that just gets you there. And I, I started seeing like camera lenses picking them up. <laughs> and there's an SD card and oh shit, that's a Bolex. Better grab that. And I get to the bottom, he's like, holy cow, man, that was crazy. I'm drunk. And I'm like, I had handfuls of all, all his gear. gear. He just didn't do the zipper up. That's, but also, Apre was actually invented, under my knowledge, at St. Anton, at a Ooh. bar called the Kangaroo Bar, I think. It's really? Called. And it's amazing. And it all started there. Like, that was the stem. And that's why we all love Austria for its Apre and all these beautiful things. But it deserves the credit. We have to give Austria the credit for it. So it, it doesn't surprise me that it started there. I mean, fuck, dude. Fucking St. Anton. Oh, my God. Can we just, like, teleport there right now? I think, yeah. Europe, I think Europe's actually getting good snow, huh? This year. It looks good. Fuck. looks good. Where, yeah, where it's snow, it's yeah, snowing right here. Too. So no, no, no. So. Yeah, it looks oh, like. By it, the way, Calgary, you guys can fly in here, and it's only a two-day quarantine period right now. By the way. Oh. Oh yeah. You can't drive. That's, that's mellow. Uh, yeah, we have this uh, thing going on in Calgary. It's the only airport across Canada where it's you get tested as soon as you arrive. You get a test in forty-eight hours, and then you're free to travel. That's out. awesome. Cool. That's so just smart. thank you, Canada. Just say. Well, I will say the last time I went to Calgary, I got COVID. <laughs> So. <laughs> that wasn't Calgary. That was British Columbia. You were you were yeah, in the I know. back country of British Columbia. Don't oh, you throw shit. my province I, under the bus? I did. I did the one thing you shouldn't do during COVID, which is go pile yes. into a 
fucking cabin with 50 fucking had an orgy with 50 guys <laughs> just kissing butt it's it it pretty funny this this crew that i go up to chatter creek with like you know we have this uh this like thread on uh whatsapp or whatever where we're constantly like talking shit or whatever and the other day i just like found these photos in my in my phone and i was like you know what is this what gave us all COVID? like this photo or you know it's like keenan rice fucking with his shirt off bear hugging chuck t and chuck t's got his shirt off and <laughs> then they're doing this thing where they're fucking splashing water all over each other and spitting beer in each other's mouths and sitting in a hot tub with all these old Such people and i'm just like was it this photo oh, or did COVID start here or <laughs> Which, oh which activity? And it's 100 kilometers in the backcountry. You can only get there by helicopter or sled. And that was where it all started. Well, you know what's <laughs> crazy is like th- we went when it was just getting like heated. Like I didn't want to go. I was like fucking gripped. I, I kind of had a gut feeling we were all good. We get up there and it's fucking hectic. And then, but then once you're up in the mountains, you're kind of like watching the world fall apart, like on the outside, you know, like there was definitely a couple days where we were like, God, this is the best place we could ever. Oh, the world's yeah, just no. disintegrating out there or whatever, you know, uh, just like being up but in the mountains. You don't get internet there, like, out there, do you? Do they have yeah, a, there's oh, internet. Fuck yeah, there's internet. It's, it's, it's not great. Cool. It's not okay. enough to like sit on your phone all day, but Anyway, you know, you're up there for a couple of days, like just so stoked. Like we don't want to be in the real world. Like it's great to be up here in the mountains until we got that call on the radio that fucking home got sent at home with a fever. And then we were oh, like, oh man, fuck, we are all fucked. Every one of us is fucked. Yeah, lodges don't survive one. No, I mean, that, that's that been a problem. That's always a problem with, with cat lodges is like, one person goes up there with the fucking flu, dude. They fuck everybody's scene up. Like, you know, like yeah. it's, it, you know, and it's usually a fucking Euro. Like some, it's almost <laughs> always a Euro. <laughs> they invented that prey and they brought the virus. I just, oh I, man. I love claiming that Euros are the ones that always get us sick on these trips. It's just, who, I don't know. Who got you oh. sick? Who was first hit up there? Come on, let's throw them under the bus. I think it was uh, Dave Benedict. I think he's the one that I think he brought it from Europe because he flew through. He flew through Munich and like he. I think he brought it. No, there there was actually a Canadian guy that brought it up to the lodge, but I think that half the crew probably had it before we even got up there. Yeah, like, like we we got to we got to the airport already on the fist bump program in like March, you know. I was like, "Don't come near me." Macon's just runs up to me and fucking hugs me right after he got off the plane. I'm, I know for a fact he didn't wash his hands when he got off the plane. <laughs> I was like, "We're all yeah, fucked. love." Love is more important, right? Yeah, I guess so. Do, do you think trade shows are over? <laughs> That's fucking I'm, disgusting, dude. I mean, we I was handing out hand sanitizer. I mean, I think everyone was like pretty hand sanitized out towards the end of that dude in Vegas. Like well, isn't isn't the so disgusting, man. Like, this month. I I uh, lost all track when it went to Colorado. I, I was at OR last year when it like they were talking about it, and I was like, huh, like all these samples coming from all the over the world, like all these people are millions, like, ah, like millions oh, we'll see what happens <laughs> trade shows are done dude i mean that's just disgusting without a pandemic like, dude, yeah like, i'm always like on the fist buck fist bump program anyways just because i'm like so, dude, i don't know you're at the strip club with your fucking hands all over some ugh. dude every everybody everybody used to just show up to vegas with fucking wrecked immune systems and then they just fucking pummel yeah. the first few days and then and then you're just shaking hands like you know, taking this guy's flu, yeah. shaking yeah, it to this guy, then throwing a fucking chew in, then like shaking this <laughs> guy's some hand, chicken fingers, then if going you're, and playing you're smart, blackjack. You're, you're drinking a glass of cars. whiskey while you're doing it so that, you know, you're disinfecting with every sip. Yeah. No oh, more, man. No more trade shows, dude. I, I, I mean, I mean, are people just going to be selling direct online in the future? Like, I mean, like eighty percent increase of. I mean, how many business. how many shops how many shops went out of business this year, dude? Like, oh my god, crazy dude, shops, like restaurants, everything. Like, like, 
these snowboard companies like that are still running on this like pre-book, you know, like distributor sh- rep shop program. It's like, fuck, dude. Like, I bet you there are so many orders canceled this year, and just I bet. Oh my, I can't. It's unfortunate even imagine. because yeah, it's going to clean out a lot of companies, and it's. And, but but the one fortunate thing, at least in my opinion, is uh, a lot of these corporations are so balanced on like a dime missing and they go out of business. So I'm hoping that the big, some of the big players rather than some of the little players, because little players are risk takers and they can sit on, they can be poor for a little while. Um, I'm hoping it goes the other way, but I don't, yeah. I'm not. That well, bad. yeah, it's so, the, these companies that are too big to like adapt quickly. Totally. They're yeah, like, Oh, like we lost a uh, 1% market share. We got to shut the doors. Yeah. Okay. They're, uh, see you later. Good. Yeah, I'd love to see it come back to the and, and that great. all that would be great. But I think we'll, we'll maybe see, it's just maybe the industry is just going to get wiped clean and then just start over again. You know, I think m- more than ever, uh, people want to be outside, man. And I yeah. think I don't think that the snow industry di- is doing bad right now. I think <laughs> everybody was scared, but I think if from my knowledge, people sold a ton of shit this fall. i think i think in the end they did but i think when yeah. this thing first started there was this oh was sure. canceling like people were cutting riders like i bet you it was yeah. fucking gnarly dude and then yeah. and well, then the in data, the end they, the data on online is is incredible and the, the amount of therapy shopping that's going on uh over the last oh, yeah. 10 months of people like who are just bored and they can yeah. go on and instantly buy things without touching it, dude, holding I'll, it working I'll, for it i'll tell you this year with bluebird was the best year we've kind of ever had. I mean, of course, you're an like, online company. This is like this no, is but sick. I mean, it was like sick. you know, sixty some percent new like customers wow. this year. Wow, like that's great. We did. I mean, we did more in the first couple weeks that we were open than we did the whole last season. The season two years ago, the last time we had the shop open, like kids are you- kids are definitely out fucking shredding. Do you still have a snowboard team? I don't know. I think like if, <laughs> if you, I've been, I've been sending product out to some people, but like if you put a I'm sticker, if you Stick. put a sticker on your board, you're on the team. Like I don't want to decide it. I want people to decide yeah. they're on it. Because uh, nice. I don't know. It's just weird, like claiming people's names. And like if I claimed everyone's names on it, half the dudes like haven't even been on a snowboard in fucking a couple of years. <laughs> didn't, didn't you put out an ad once, Willie, with everyone's name on it? And it was like honestly, it just covered the picture. We it probably was so had, long. I mean, it was we such had a, a long list. Yeah, but that was back when you know we had we had a, a someone licensing us and I could give away that it. much product. Like the thing that basically puts us out of business is like giving product away or like mm-hmm. yeah you know kids like you know wanting to return stuff like shipping and like hooking people up with product kills me mm-hmm. so it's fucking tough but then like what are you doing if you're if people you know like what's the point if you're not like at least getting people you know some product mm-hmm. you know like what i what still got we- a, I got a bunch of old wax that i still use i mean how much wax does a guy need you know well, I got to get you on the new stuff. It's quite a bit faster. Oh, cool. I could yeah. use that the fast I, now that I've been hitting jumps again. Yeah, I'll be back in I'll be back in a week. I love that. It's quite okay. a bit faster. It is. It's <laughs> it's faster. it's uh superior to what we had going before. But let's uh let's do a wrap up here and uh, maybe just hear about uh what you've got on the plate uh and what you're working on this season it's on yourself. Totally, man. Um like I like I, I'm just kind of always on my own program doing my own thing and um was fortunate enough to to gain uh, enough support this winter to do a full project. Um basically we had this idea last winter I Yeti basically gave me the funding to have a a filmer so i hired this guy fred who's amazing uh filmer and sledder and so we just kind of teed off last winter and got a bunch of really good shit um linked in with crews from pat and blake and trav and all those guys and then you know we kind of had this idea to just put a project out this fall just to edit but i was like dude we have all this good footage everybody's putting projects out let's just do something different and so we rolled that in 
into a two-year project that uh, my good friend Sean Black and Asher Coles are going to be editing and producing along with Fred. And it's just going to be kind of like a self-sustained Wyoming all-around project with Gooch and myself, um, campers, trailheads, hunting elk. Uh, uh, I want to see my whole this program, summer. you know, um, and sledding, splitboarding, and kind of Gooch and Gooch and my my philosophy of how we live and how we ride and, and operate. And um, I've been fortunate enough to link in with Pat Moore and Sage Kotzenberg. And so they're kind of coming on as well with some of the projects and whoever else comes down the pipeline, you know, it's kind of an open invite, but we're going to hop in campers and stay at trailheads and, and uh, eliminate the, the drive and kind of just immerse ourselves where, where we ride. And that's the, that's the main idea. You know, I have some really good sponsors come on. I just started working with this company called Ranch Rider Spirits and they do this awesome tequila sparkling water. And, you know, if I'm going to party a little bit, like I like to have something that's clean. I don't feel like shit the next day, you know, like all these heavy beers, everybody's pumping and like excited about it. I'm just like, it's not really yeah. my It's also the only non-depressant alcohol on earth is Dude, agave spirits. That, that's what I'm saying. So these guys do a really good job out of Austin. And then um, my really good friends at Black Rifle Coffee, um, they're veteran owned. Um, they do really good, really good work with all the veteran operations and foundations awesome. and they give back to a lot of the, the you know the first line responders um and i i just have a close um close tie to the, the the military and the veterans i had some family that was in it and are no longer with us so that's always just kind of given and then obviously arbor and all, all the guys that come along with that yeti and so we're going to just make a full run at it and see what happens uh tell us some cool stories and you know uh kind of let let happen what happens with mother nature and uh we already got a bunch of cool shit in the bag with those boys so i'll be excited to see uh what we end up with so i well, you ain't healthy wait you know yeah. you guys are you guys are welcome out at the warehouse i'm sure i'm gonna see you guys down there oh buddy we'll be coming through do some podcasts some skating i can't and, wait uh, you i just know, you know that'll you're, I, just, you're, I love how grounded you are as well and how independent you are i've always like love that about your riding it's like i'm gonna just do whatever i want and that's you can see that in your riding uh i love it eddie yeti and uh i'm holding this up right now oh yeah yeah, yeah cheers this was cheers. found on the streets in portland by jess gibson that old filmer oh hell yeah uh, i love that they're getting to jess. involved he's amazing um dude yeti is like such an amazing brand that they cross all spectrums of humankind, everything. Yeah. everything. Um, they're sinking you know, so far in their the advance. Man, they're I, I am so honored to be a part of that that brand, and they've opened so many doors for me. And um, yeah, I mean, I'm the feeding myself because of Yeti. Hay. You love talking about them. They're not like it's not like a drink sponsor where you're like, yeah, kids, put this poison in your body. They gave me yeah. twenty thousand dollars for a helicopter. Hooray! Well, I it's think it's like, important, you know, yeah. to like. Yeah. You know, I've really like my my portfolio of, of support of support and sponsors that I've, you know, kind of honed over the years. I don't take I, I don't take lightly to who I support. And, you know, and if I'm going to support something and it's not, a, it, you know, obviously I make a living, but it's not about the money for me. It's about like me being able to authentically talk about the the, the gear or the the product that I use from from Hana one to approach CBD water, you know, it's like, it's something that I, I really use in my everyday life and I really back and I would never support something that is bad for somebody, um, sugar water or this stuff no, for no amount of money. You know, um, my integrity is more important to me than anything. And when I lay a smile and, and know that I, I did good and, and I sleep well at night, and um, that that's just super important, you know. So I've been able to like I'm I'm fortunate to have aligned with these companies that that kind of have the same the same morals and, and values as I and uh, and I think that's what it's all about. I, I never sell yourself out, and you know always be authentic to yourself and and walk the path that you believe in because no, nobody knows better than you. You know, you always listen to yourself. Absolutely, I love it. Real quick before you go, Alex Pashley had one question he wanted me to oh, ask you. Fuck. Yeah, what's he, up? He, he wanted to know: is it uh, is it harder to dig a, a snowmobile out or to dig a calf out of a, a mother a mother oh, cow's pull, vagina? Pull, pull a calf? 
Yeah. Ah, one's a little slimier than the other, but uh what would you rather do? <laughs> Man, to breathe life into a little calf is pretty is pretty uh rewarding and to dig Pashley sled out just pisses me off. So yeah. <laughs> I get humor out of Pashley's, but like I, you know, I'd rather be a calf, maybe, you know, it, it's it's easier on the old back. I like no how you likes digging other I like how you turn that into digging his sled out. <laughs> oh, well no, I mean you can ask Ashley about me saving his sled a few times last winter. Yeah. I, I am That's why he goes that. out with you. He's like, I Yeah, know, well, I mean he's comedy, dude. It's it's funny. Uh he's he's a very capable human being, but okay. we all have, you know, with, with sleds comes um somebody's gonna fuck it up at some point you know including myself but yeah it's i i'm i'm, I'm glad that i can be there for him yeah <laughs> the young man sport for sure well i just got got a i got my fucking cheetah racks in the mail yesterday oh you went so, cheetah good yeah mm. i'm i'm all set nope. for when I, when no I one makes home. a better rack yeah i'm fucking shout out to dave Thanks. Dave. couldn't find a fucking we're so hard to find Everyone was well, sold out. Mark fucking was right. Uh, Everyone. Mark, Mark Sullivan was saying racks are going to be gone this year. Yeah, but I, everyone's I'm, getting out there. I'm set now, so let's link up when I get back. We'll rip the resort. We'll go. We'll go laugh at the whole uh, shenanigans that's going to be going on next week. Hell yes, brother! I I look forward to it, man. This was fun. Yeah, thank you, Mark. And if you yep. guys also too, Mark, if you ever want to come up, you're more than welcome. You're you're the kind of writer I I'd be proud honored hey, to show around i your appreciate that mad respect mad respect my friend right back at you all right really guys adios thanks, thanks so much and uh, thanks mark <laughs> later guys